Last time on Big Data and Brews, Ron Bodkin talked about his role as VP of Engineering at Quantcast prior to co-founding Think Big Analytics. Nielsen and Comscore were saying the only way you could measure internet properties and, and advertising campaigns was with small samples, and we proved you could directly measure the internet, and that quickly led us to using Hadoop. We put it in production in 2006. His work with Facebook, now one of the biggest Hadoop adopters. We showed them what we had done to make Hadoop work well and get meaningful scalability and great results. Mm -hmm. And it was pretty important in them deciding to embrace Hadoop. And the goal of Think Big Analytics. We want to help customers be successful through the life cycle of big data adoption. And that often starts with a strategy and roadmap, helping bring the technology and business teams together. Now, for more Big Data and Brews. Welcome back to Big Data and Proust with Ron Botkin from Think Big Analytics. Cheers. Cheers. So we talked about your history and what Think Big is doing, but let's talk a little bit about technology. Sure. Um, that's um, your area of expertise. So as you build those big data applications, what kind of tools are you guys using? So, you know, I think there's a couple of things. One is that we're big believers that fundamentally open source is the foundation of the platforms that will be successful in big data, that mm -hmm. a lot of what's exciting about big data is the economics of open source. Hadoop is an open source ecosystem, is you know a thriving, successful ecosystem. You know, if you didn't believe that before, the recent announcement of a billion dollars of funding and leading Hadoop companies is a pretty strong statement that, yeah. that Hadoop is gonna be the center of uh, important open source ecosystem. And you know, so we, we kind of look at it as there is two very different parts of the big data um, application stack. You know, mm -hmm. there's, there's the analytic core, mm -hmm. which is centered around Hadoop, mm -hmm. but there's interesting pieces in, in orbit around that. Mm -hmm. And then you've got more of the real time architecture, which is in edge serving, web serving, responding to events, mm -hmm. where you'll typically have a pattern that at scale, you've got large numbers of data centers distributed around the globe. Mm -hmm. And so you need to have technology deployed locally in each of those. Mm -hmm. So, and in your marrow? Or? Yeah, so you'll typically have you know various forms of, this is where event, NoSQL databases like Cassandra come, come to their strength of having eventual consistency and models for replicating the data. And there's mm -hmm. interesting patterns and interplays between the analytic core and those systems of engagement at the edge. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's a little more of a shooting match as to what's going to win in the market mm -hmm. on the edge. Mm -hmm. It's the, 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 you know, with uh, Cassandra and MongoDB is a couple of leading NoSQL databases. Mm -hmm. um, whereas, you know, I think the Hadoop ecosystem is absolutely the winner <clears throat> and anything that's successful in mm -hmm. the analytic core, it gets pulled into Hadoop. Mm -hmm. and a great example of that would be the Berkeley stack mm -hmm. that uh, the, the folks at University of Berkeley uh, created some innovative technologies like Spark as mm -hmm. a, a lower latency, better caching approach for mm -hmm. doing MapReduce type computations. It's mm -hmm. great for machine learning. Yeah. You know, they, they raised $14 million from Andreessen Horowitz to start Databricks, yeah. um, but they're now developing relationships with all the major Hadoop distributions. It's yep. being included, it's being wrapped up with yarn. So it's a great example of, it's being pulled into what's considered Hadoop. It's yep. innovative, right? So yep. the Hadoop of today and the Hadoop of next year is very different than wow, sure. the, the Nutch Hadoop that we were talking about earlier, but it's still as a community evolving and building its capabilities. Mm. So you, you talked a little bit about Mongo and Cassandra, like you guys using both of them? Yeah, we do. We, where, where, where is kind of like, uh, this is where the use case is standing more in this direction or this kind of requirements more in that direction? Yeah, so you know, we use <clears throat> we, we use a number of NoSQL databases. Mm -hmm. We use a lot of HBase, more typically in analytic use cases and okay. less around that edge serving deployed out to many data centers. Yeah. Um, I'd say that we've done a lot more with Cassandra because uh, you know, it, it, we tend to focus on on big data applications which have large scale, yeah. and we found that it's a more reliable kind of better scaling mm -hmm. system. You know, the architecture of Mongo uh, makes it probably better suited for more department level yeah. uh, NoSQL applications. So, you know, we see it as probably more promising in scenario where someone's doing something like a MySQL type application. Well, yeah. MongoDB has got a, a very compelling API for developers, mm -hmm. and it's really easy to get up and running but we don't see nearly as many people scaling it up to big data proportions, and, you know, in large part because it's tricky to get the memory management right, the way it, it allocates 
uh, objects doesn't make it easy to uh, to get some good cache locality, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to, yeah. typically we see when people are using Mongo and big data applications, they have to throw memcached or the equivalent right. in front of it. Right. So is memcached kind of the standard caching thing even in front of Cassandra orders? So? So a lot more, we'll see people that are using Cassandra and relying on it to do a good job of having caching without having to build a separate caching layer. Okay. So we don't see it as nearly as common that people are okay. actually building a separate caching tier in front of a Cassandra database mm -hmm. as they do in front of Mongo yeah. or traditional relational. Okay. So what I'm hearing is computation, enrichment, cleaning the data, maybe even build some prediction done in Hadoop or related technologies, and then results push into kind of a Cassandra that serves a website or a, a, an app? Well, it, it's a great question, right? So, you, you know, we, we kind of think of it this way, that, um, you know, in the, the real-time edge uh, system, which can be using any number of respond, response engines, could be using old-fashioned Apache or, yep. or Node, you know, Nginx, there's a bunch of options for the, the serving uh, layer here, but behind that, you'll typically have a little bit of relational for acid consistency, right? Mm -hmm. For the, the behind these systems, there's usually some high value data you don't want to lose. Yeah. So committing transactions, orders. Um, then you'll have... So just so I understand this correctly, so this will be your online store, right? Yeah, and like maybe if you make that... a purchase, right. okay. a transaction gets committed here. Yeah before you return the page. Mm -hmm. You'll have NoSQL that's being used to provide scale of things like profiles and mm -hmm. recommendations. Mm -hmm. And, and the, the interplay here is that you'll have machine learned models that, that are being held here that, that say something about the user's interest or you know, in response to this incoming device event, is this likely to be a failure and I need to escalate, we need to replace this thing right away. Um, usually you'll have a, a hybrid where you'll have a simplified ability to update model scoring on the edge. You'll mm -hmm. have some code that's running in the simplest form just running inside your serving engine mm -hmm. that reads the state from NoSQL, updates the model, and then writes an update out here. Mm -hmm. The event stream also gets pushed back out to your Hadoop cluster where you're doing the long-term uh, computation. Um, these models get refreshed. Uh, I think Nathan Mars puts this well in his Lambda architecture, talking about batch computed views, that yeah. you're computing views here that ideally these NoSQL databases will have um, a, a short window of data that's computed transiently mm -hmm. in real time, you know, based yeah. on like, well, they just looked at this page, so I need to immediately update my model. But the long-term propensity is being refreshed from a consistent view in the batch world. Yeah. Um, they, they, uh, Nathan would have two versions of NoSQL, right? A scratch, read, write no, NoSQL, and a, a, um, a read-only version that gets bulk exports. Yeah. In practice, we just don't see a lot of people investing in a separate NoSQL database. Yeah. They use one, they rely on it to handle both purposes. Um, you know, th there are cases where people want to do uh, things like, sometimes people have search applications, so Elasticsearch or Solar, or in the commercial world, Splunk, as engines for doing distributed search, mm -hmm. right? That, that, that's typically uh, a different scheme that most of the NoSQL databases don't handle very well. Sometimes people will try to do that in Mongo because it's a little better at it, but more often you have a separate yeah. thing. That's your background, <laughs> so I know you know that yeah. space really well. Um, far be it for me to lecture you on distributed <laughs> search engines, but um, you know that, that um, the, other, the other thing that you'll see it, it sometimes is people doing uh, you know, streaming uh, mm -hmm. computations where they, they, what we see is that you can get pretty far with um, the ability to just have a simple uh, logic distributed across a, a farm of web servers and hitting reading and writing state from NoSQL. Mm -hmm. the, the streaming engines like a storm, you're typically looking at that when you've got computations that are sufficiently complex that you don't you can't just do it quickly in a single process. You really have to scale it across a network. Yeah. So it tends to be more advanced. You need mm -hmm. to tend to have things like more sophisticated models, right? We've seen We've seen it in two places. We've seen mm -hmm. it in web scale startups like mm -hmm. Quantcast adopted streaming to make mm -hmm. it, you know, a storm to make it easy to have live updates to profiles mm -hmm. as you're looking at a page. Mm -hmm. um, of course, some of the originators of the technology like LinkedIn, you know, we've done this with ad tech customers that wanted to get, you know, real time updates to, to see counters of, you know, what's going on in, on every page or every campaign. Yeah. And then on Wall Street, right, where people have long sure. had streaming things for market tracking. Mm -hmm. so, that, so that's on the edge. Um, in, in the analytic core, 
you know, it, there's a range of things. Typically, people will do things like, you know, of course, ingest the data, and you might use a Kafka or a Flume or any of those kinds of technologies. You're a big Kafka fan or a big Flume fan? Well, you know, I'd say that we think Kafka has a very elegant architecture and mm -hmm. is well designed, right? Yeah. So it's much more reliable when you design a, a solution around Kafka. You don't have nearly the same concerns around late arriving data. data. Yeah. Um, however, we still see that because commercial support is predominantly for Flume and all the distributions, many companies uh, that are out there aren't interested in, in, in relying on community support for a technology okay. like Kafka. And so yeah. they're willing, for them, the occasional delay in data arrival or data loss from Flume is acceptable. And so they're, yeah. they prefer having commercial support to having so, kind of the elegant architecture. So let me think about it. Let me make sure I hear what you just said. So I'm okay to lose data if I can pay money to get commercial support <laughs> over not losing data but not have commercial support. <laughs> something, something like that, yeah. Okay, so, so just checking. So that, that's right. And, but, you know, look a at great it. sales force. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> hey, we don't sell either, right? Yeah, I know. Mean, but, I'm just saying. But, but, you know, um, what I'd say is that most of the time when people are putting together big data architectures and they're doing streaming of events mm -hmm. back, they're building systems where um, they are not needing to capture every last event mm -hmm. where, you know, if it's 99.9% accurate, they're sure. able to, to build models and respond and it, it meets their needs. Mm -hmm. And, you know, losing data for high value things is not acceptable. That right. That's people, why you have your asset databases. You right? have your asset databases. Yeah. And, you know, if you have a high value, low volume stream, you can use more traditional messaging approaches yeah. that are you know, guaranteed commit and won't lose data, right? Yeah. So there are approaches for that, that super high value data it tends to be smaller in scale, right? Yeah, usually. Mm -hmm. So so that's that's the case. So yeah, Kafka is more elegant and, and we like it, but most customers we find are favoring commercial support. Um, I guess the, the argument for why they want commercial support is uh, they don't want to have data loss through their mistakes, their problems in operating something like Kafka and, yeah. and they, there's nowhere to turn. So, um, okay, so you pre-process recommendations maybe for every single person. Um, I guess that that's what you t talked about in the views. Yeah, so right? the models you would compute. Yeah, and then you put them into like a, a Cassandra and then you, you, you show recommendations here mm -hmm. and you mix this all up with, with the data streams that feedback and, you know, maybe some search uh, and um, kind of the asset database, uh, traditional RDBMS to like run your e-commerce store. So <clears throat> do you have from like, sounds like you build that quite a few times. Do you have some numbers, what kind of sales uplift you can get with an architecture like this, a recommendation engine? I guess that's one of the classical use cases. Yeah, so recommendation engine mm -hmm. or, or predicting failure, um, you know, for device data. You know, I'd say we've seen great metrics in different use cases, but um, it's, it's not a case of saying, well, you know, you know, we've Always. done 20 e-commerce e yeah. yeah. sites of this type, and this is yeah. exactly what you get, right? Mm -hmm. And we've done lookalike models for mobile advertising. We've done commerce recommendations. We've done recommendations for, uh, for looking at, uh, you know, when an event comes in for a device to understand if it might break or not. And, and the other thing that's worth noting is that um, this represents a more sophisticated architecture, this loop of the offline and online data mm -hmm. that many enterprises rather than this are starting with analytics use cases where rather than closed right. loop yeah. driving models, they're, they're ingesting data from both, uh, both their online systems, but also from various high value relational systems that yeah. maybe got fed by an online system somewhere along the way, but they don't have a closed loop. And they're doing, they're taking that raw data, mm -hmm. they're able to do data science to explore it, mm -hmm. build views to make it easier to access the data, organize it, denormalize it, mm -hmm. build summary uh, aggregates. And what we're starting to see is traditionally the next step was dump that into a, a database, a relational database, mm -hmm. a classic, you know, a Teradata, Exadata, mm -hmm. you know, use MicroStrategy or your favorite BI tool. But we're starting to see is instead that um, there's all alternatives, right? Mm -hmm. So we've built, um, we've built an accelerator to make it easy to do this and push this into HBase, mm -hmm. uh, so you can have 
pre-computed aggregates and an API to quickly get at them mm -hmm. from a JavaScript dashboard, right? To mm -hmm. let people have deep drill down and mm -hmm. not have to deal with a relational database, but have low latency access. Um, you know, the, the other thing people are doing is they're starting to play with these emerging SQL engines. Mm -hmm. uh, I know you love SQL, so yeah, you appreciate this. I do. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, you know, the, the uh, roughly, you know, the tools like at Impala, Presto, trying to take take a lot of what people have done in relational and say, well, let's just kind of graft an MPP database on top of Hadoop, mm -hmm. um, you know, which I think th th there is a tension that a lot of energy goes into trying to make the old relational world work on top of the new world. Sure. And you know, that kind of comes back to what you said before, right? You, you send someone to the training and like, oh, that looks like the old stuff. Right. Maybe. So, so for <laughs> sure. I mean, people, people are very interested in that, mm -hmm. but it's a disruptive technology and like right. most disruptive technologies, um, the best uses are solving problems you couldn't solve the old way, not yeah. taking the old approach and, and running it in yeah. a new world, right? So I, I think that there's there's more to to an analytics and Hadoop than making it an MPP database on top of HDFS. Yeah, what is the stupidest you can ever do, right? It's a streaming file system. Anyhow, <laughs> we had long, a lot of BS and a lot of conversations about this. Let's double click on this area on the Hadoop. So what kind of technologies are you guys using there? You go straight back to writing MapReduce jobs or you, what's your favorite higher level abstraction pick, Hive, Cascading? Um, and yeah. what's the, maybe help uh, us to understand what's the difference, where's the one you know may, more favorable over the sure. other? Well, I mean, definitely, I think one of the strengths of Hadoop is it's a polyglot environment. You can use a variety of tools. Mm -hmm. uh, we love HCatalog mm -hmm. as a way of having a common set of abstractions so that you can use different tools for different purposes. Mm -hmm. uh, we do a lot. We do a lot with higher level languages, Hive and Pig, mm -hmm. um, often writing Java UDFs. Mm -hmm. uh, we find those to be very productive mm -hmm. and, and easily maintainable and with HCatalog good abstractions, so. But you can't yet write a UDF for pick that you reuse in Hive, no, can you? No, yeah. so you're gonna use different, write mm -hmm. a different UDF for different purposes. Mm -hmm. You write some common code and, and sure. wrap it differently in the two, right? So sure. we like those two. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we'll, we definitely do some straight MapReduce, some cascading. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we've we've done little bits of, of other um, languages like Scalding, right? So, mm -hmm. so there's there's a variety of options there. Mm -hmm. um, part of it is, you know, we, we tend to select the technologies that are maintainable and useful for our customers. On the data science side, we do a lot with Python streaming mm -hmm. and for prototyping our Hadoop when mm -hmm. we're doing distributed data science. Mm -hmm. um, we think Spark is going to be interesting. You know, we're starting to see a lot of interest in it and it's starting to be feasible. I mean, traditionally before Yarn, Running Spark meant getting yet running yet another cluster, mm -hmm. and um, but with Yarn being able to actually run it on the same cluster is going to be interesting. Mm -hmm. Yarn, what do you think about Yarn versus Mesos? So you know, I I, uh, I wrote an article when Yarn was announced uh, yeah. on InfoQ a few years ago, asking, well, why do we need Yarn? But yeah. but the net effect is, I think having. Um, a resource manager for Hadoop is critical, and mm -hmm. I think that the community has lined up around Yarn in a, in a fundamental way so that while there's some nice elements to the way Vasos was designed, that mm -hmm. it's not the standard, and I think Yarn is going to provide tremendous value in terms of you really did need to go beyond straight MapReduce as the only approach for writing distributed applications mm -hmm. you know, for a rich analytic system like Hadoop with a distributed file system, right? So we're going to see Yarn now it's in all the mainstream distributions. We really think that it, it will be dominant by early next year that people will be using Yarn in production for a range of applications. Mm -hmm. And from a, from an Outlook perspective, what is the technology you're most excited or what's the technology that's still missing? So, so good questions. I mean, I think there's there, there's such a range of areas to expand. I mean, it, it's still very nascent to do um, some of the more advanced analytics, for distributed data science in Hadoop. It's still far too complicated. So the, 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 the typical pattern is for most problems, people you use a tool like Hive or Pig to pull out of a massive data set, a small enough chunk of data that they can work in a single machine in R or Python or what mm -hmm. have you, SAS maybe, um, and then, if they have to scale it up to a large number of machines, it's a significant custom effort to translate that into mm -hmm. a scalable algorithm. 
So the emergence of scalable machine learning libraries for Hadoop is going to be really exciting. Um, you know, but that also gets back to, we see that there's stages of adoption that customers usually start their, their big data journey by cost cutting and scale, right? Yeah. They, they, they shift ETL or mainframe workloads or their old system isn't scaling and rather than doing yet another legacy system, they, they move to Hadoop. Then the next thing we see is agile analytics where it's really about them being able to start to explore data in a raw format, ask questions without investing all the traditional waterfall effort to, to plumb a field through to a BI tool and start to understand it. That's um, where they buy data mirror, right? Absolutely, <laughs> right. That's where they buy data mirror and, and that's where they, they start to invest in uh, data science skills to have mm -hmm. people that can work with data in a more complex format and get mm -hmm. insight out of it. Right, and then we start to see you know, more of an optimization where they're starting to use predictive analytics to drive closed loop outcomes, start to make better business decisions, drive automated response like recommendation engines. And then finally, it's really transformation, becoming a data-driven organization, really relying on data and experimentation and analytics as a core part of how they operate their business. Mm -hmm. right? Most enterprises are somewhere here, or yeah. here in a proof of concept stage, not yet deploying anything. So that means that you know, it's when you get here that you start to get into really significant data science, uh, you know, distributed machine learning needs. So the pioneers, the web scale companies, Quantcast and LinkedIn and Google are, well, Google doesn't use Hadoop, but you know, they're in that stage, right, of being, having really transformed themselves through big data. Um, so they, the companies at this stage and later tend to have a real appetite yeah. for the data science tools, but it's not mainstream yet. I think right around here, you start to see a lot more appetite for for blending some of the capabilities that are good about data governance and, and metadata management in a traditional database world with what's good about an agile, mm -hmm. less structured world in Hadoop. Mm -hmm. And you know, we, we don't think anybody's really working on that yet. Mm -hmm. I, I was, no, there was one startup that was started working on that and discovered that they didn't think there was enough of a market to build their business. Okay. So they pivoted and they're now working on making it possible to take legacy databases and have them run inside of Hadoop. Mm. I don't know if that's a great business model either. Uh, there's certainly more customers that would buy it if you could sell it, but you yeah. know, that's a little bit like uh, saying, well, we're going to sell uh, uh, fast horses for carts rather than to compete yeah. against cars, right? Great. Thank you so much for right. coming Thank by and thanks for the beer. Uh, my Cheers. pleasure. Cheers.